has missed the plot by thinking the Old Testament is irrelevant? Would God work so hard with the patriarchs of old and the prophets to write in a book for future generations and then say it is useless? Perhaps the better questions we need to ask are, what secrets are encoded in the Torah that would equip modern generations to master their economies? Are they secrets hidden in the life of Abraham that would enable a business to become a blessing to a generation? Was the African continent born for oppression and slavery? Dr. Tich Tananyua has had several encounters with God that have moved him to writing the Wealth Mastery Trilogy. Three powerful books that are loaded with biblical evidence that God wants you wealthy. In these encounters, Dr. Tich Tananyua has invested over 7,000 hours of research going through the Torah to unravel the ancient secrets of the Hebrew nation. The books will enable the reader to discover how to break free from financial and economic slavery, wisdom to manage personal finances and establish generational wealth, how to use your wealth to change the world for the good of mankind. God's plan has always been to establish the earth as a colony of heaven. As in the words of the Messiah, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. These three books will bring you back to the understanding of the original purpose for wealth and position you to be a world shaker. From housewife to CEO. Well, praise God. Good evening. How are you doing today? I trust you're well, and I want to welcome you this evening to Couch Time with Apostle Teach Tanya Niwa. I'm excited to have an opportunity with you in the Word as we study the Word of God together. I believe you were ministered to yesterday. I believe you learned something yesterday. I believe there was impartation that began to happen uh, yesterday with the first session that we had on this second uh, season of uh, Wealth Masters. Thank you so much for joining me here on this live broadcast or you're, maybe you're watching on other platforms. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're so excited that you are here and I've got some great notes that I want to really go through. And I'll encourage you, stay connected, click like, share, subscribe to my YouTube channel so that you can stay connected with the content that will be a blessing to you. And I believe that God will really empower you. Right now, we're focusing on empowering you in the area of financial wealth, financial freedom, financial increase. Biblical principles that are loaded in our Bibles from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. God has always had it on his mind to move you to a place of wealth. And so I want you to have the same mind uh, so that you begin to practice the Word of God. Take the Word of God seriously and study the Word of God diligently. Now, I've spent uh, thousands of hours literally studying these scriptures, particularly in the book of Genesis and in the Torah. I have my Torah here, and if you were to look at it, you would really see that it is well read. The pages are dirty, covered with, with all kinds of mess, because I'm always opening that of almost on a daily basis, and I can spend hours just studying. I want to share some of this wisdom with you as we began yesterday, when we're talking about the protocol of the kingdom of God, what God established with Cain and Abel, when, God, when uh, Adam taught Cain and Abel, how to behave themselves in the area of worship, in the area of ministering to the Lord. Cain violates the divine protocol. Abel honors the divine protocol. God turns, we looked at it from the Torah yesterday, God turns and looks at or approves of uh, Abel and his offering, and Cain and his offering did not get God's approval. This is in Genesis chapter 4. After a period of time, Cain brought an offering to Hashem of the fruit of the ground, and Abel. Uh, and as for Abel, he also brought the firstlings of his flock from their choicest. The King James says, the fat thereof. Hashem turned to Abel and to his offering, but to Cain and to his offering he did not turn. This annoyed Cain exceedingly, and his countenance fell. And that became the beginning of wars from an economic perspective. But beyond the wars having a basis of economic issues or, or centered in and around economic factors, 
I'm going to show you today that uh, we closed off on this yesterday, actually, by looking at the Shema here, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord, he is one, and you shall worship the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your resources. Now, the economic premise of which wars have been fought over the years is not really about the economic status in of itself or the money or the resources or the land or the oil um, in, in Africa or the oil in Iraq or whatever it is. It's not been about that. It's about worship. It's about worship. In my latest book, which, which you see, I think right here down on the corner here, and you also see it up here, uh, Birthing a Mega Economy, one of the chapters talks about and it actually gives you uh, some statistics on some of the superstructures that have been built right from the beginning when man began to build. And we look at the building of the Tower of Babel, the buildings that took place in Babylon, and then Egypt, the building of the structures in Egypt, and then how that the uh, Egyptian pyramids held the record for the tallest structures in the world for thousands of years up until... Uh, America began to build some, uh, England, Europe began to build, I think it was a cathedral that was built that broke the records, and then from there it's been one building after another. Now the competition on having the tallest building has got nothing to do with the tallest building in of itself or the money that is invested in that building, but it has everything to do with who is worshipped behind the building. So we do a little bit of a study to show you the significance of the world's tallest buildings. If you were to do a study of the world's tallest building and the model, the business model behind each one of the buildings that have been built today, in terms of, I mean, right now, I think it's the Burj Khalifa that is holding the, the record as the tallest skyscraper, and um, they're about to build within the Islamic world, they're about to build this, uh, another building which will supersede the Burj Khalifa by far, and again, it is a statement of worship more than it is a statement of economic status. So you need to understand the spiritual implications behind everything that is happening. Now, the big question that keeps coming through is, what, where is the church? Where is the body of Christ? Where are we in terms of lifting up the name of the Lord and making a global statement of the greatness of our God? Now, we've been limited in our ability to do that because of a number of factors, one of them being the economic question. We are struggling as the body of Christ from an economic perspective. Now, you may be saying, no, maybe uh, I'm not struggling as an individual or our church is not struggling. We've got a great building. We've got lots of money in our church, etc. Now, I understand individuals prospering and I understand uh, individual churches prospering. But we need to be able to come to a place where we can make a national statement. Like when the global crisis came with the COVID-19 and all the things that were happening and the amounts of people that are hungry and so on, the church should have been at the forefront of the eradication of the poverty that was coming out of COVID-19. And I am not talking about giving a family a packet of groceries and food that will sustain them maybe for two, three days. I'm talking about a serious economic bailout. The church did not have the capacity to do that because we're not well positioned, we're not well structured, and we're not thinking according to a kingdom perspective. The people that have been giving the biggest amounts, if you can do a research right across, uh, particularly Africa, but you can look right across the world, when you look at what Jack Ma was doing and what some of the, uh, the millionaires and billionaires that gave uh, in Nigeria, that was a great example of millionaires and billionaires that gave. I think of the 14 top givers, only two or three of them that did that were Christians. In South Africa, we had a number of very wealthy people also giving in out of their pocket money a significant amount of money towards relief, etc. But if you check again, the, uh, none of the top, uh, top givers, top five, ten givers within the SA context were Christians. It was non-believers that ha carry different agendas and different mandates, and they're making a statement in the realm of the Spirit by their seed that they're giving. 
So we need to be, begin to think differently as the church so that we are able to position ourselves. And according to the calendar of God, the next 50 years, we are going to see the church taking on a new level of prominence, a new level of influence, a new level of strategic positioning in, political, in the political arena, in the media world, and also in the economic sector. We will see believers, men and women of God, strategically positioned. God has been raising them. God has been preparing them. God has positioned them. And God is about to manifest them to the world in the next the, the first phase has already kicked in. And from the time I actually wrote that prophetic word in the book, Birthing a Mega Economy, you need to get that book. And you can go to our website, birthingamegaeconomy.africa, to buy the book and read it. By the time the book was written, some of the things were already kicking into first phase. And God gave me the first 10 years and said, these are the hallmarks or the landmarks that you're going to see within the next 10 years. Some of them have already begun to happen. As you know, Malawi has a Christian president. There's another seven, well, six countries that the Lord spoke to me about that are going to see a major political shift and have leaders that are Christians, that are unapologetically Christian, that serve God, that love God. And we're going to see that in the next 10 years. And those seven countries are already geared up Things are already happening from a political perspective. The shifts are already beginning to, to take place. I could give you the list of the, the, the I could give you the list of those seven countries. Right now we are endeavoring to connect with the leaders of those countries, to pray for them, to let them know, not the leaders of the countries, but the new and upcoming leaders, in order to let them know what God is about to do within the next, some of them it's, it's a five-year period, some of them it's a seven-year period, and some of them it'll be the full ten years, but now it's about nine and a half years to go from the time the prophetic word came forth. So God is at work in the church, and we need to position ourselves for what he is doing. So now let's pick up from what we established yesterday. God established the protocol of the kingdom uh, and the protocol of becoming a wealth master. We see that in the scripture we read, Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 to uh, verse 5. Uh, and that scripture helps us understand what happened between the Cain and Abel saga. And I explained that yesterday, so please go to our YouTube channel or to our Facebook page and go to the history and you'll be able to pick that up. Cain and Abel are taught the protocol of heaven. This is, uh, this is understanding that the place of worship is the, is the place of exchange of value for value. Commerce and economics is always based on products and services and goods that are exchanged for a market value. How much is the bread? How much is the fuel? How much is the car? How much is the property? How much is the building? So it is a trading, an exchange of value for value. So the place of worship is a place of exchange of value for value. Altars are a place of exchange of value for value. And that's what you need to, to really pick up on what, what I'm saying here. The act of worship is the act of honoring God with all that you have. Are you a worshiper? Do you honor God on a daily basis, on a regular basis, on a continual basis? Worship is not the singing. Singing is an expression of worship. It is an expression of our love and of our intimacy and our divine connection with God. But I always say this, that worship, when we get to church and we sing songs um, and we don't live a life of honor outside of the 30, 40 minutes of praise and worship at church, it is similar to when you get into a public setting, you speak well of your wife and you say, this is the best wife and I love her with all of my heart. But off of the stage, off of the public platform, you do not speak the similar words of love, honor to your wife. That means your worship is empty. Your words in private must be in greater proportion than your words in public. In other words, 10% uh, of worship of your wife or of whatever it is you're worshiping is manifest publicly. The other 90% is private. So you need to understand that. But let's read a scripture here. I quoted it yesterday, but I want to read it to you. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30. 1 Samuel chapter 2, 
verse 30. God was speaking and addressing a very interesting scenario where he was about to dethrone or remove or change his mind regarding a priesthood that he had established, the Levitical priesthood that had been established through uh, Aaron, who was a descendant of Levi. And he says, you're going to be a priest uh, forever. But God then comes and he says, I'm changing my mind because there's been a breach of protocol. Here's his words. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, be it far from me. For them that honor me, I will honor. And those that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Very important scripture in understanding how to become a wealth master. God had established a covenant to say, you're going to be priests. You're going to sit in the office of the priest forever. But I now realize, I now perceive that there is no honor in your behavior or in your conduct. So I'm changing the narrative. I'm changing the storyline because there's been a breach. There's been a violation of honor. So he says, those that honor me will I honor, and those that despise me will be lightly esteemed, will be lightly esteemed. Now, these are very, a very se uh, interesting selection of words right here. So I want to, if you don't mind, let's, let's, let's do a little word study, then we'll come back to the scripture. The word honor, where, where we've just read in the book of Samuel, is taken from the Hebrew word kabod. The word kabod is the word that, uh, that speaks of the glory of God. It means the weight, the heaviness, the fullness. Figuratively, it speaks of um, the splendor, the copiousness, the gloriousness, and the honor of God, the honorability of God. So he says the word, well, pardon me, not necessarily of God, but just in general. That's what the word means, kabod. But when we talk of glory in the, in the context of worshiping God, interacting with God and what God places on us, it, then it means the gloriousness, the honorability of God, the weightiness of God, the heavy weightness of God. That's the word kabod in Hebrew. Now, let's go back to our scripture and let's read it properly because when you read the word glory and the word honor in the, in the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, it is translated from the word kabod, or root words of the similar word. But let's keep it at that simple place right now, because the word here, honor, is the word kabod. So he says, but now the Lord said, be it far from me, for them that bring glory, honor, heaviness, weightiness, on honorability to me, those will I also place honor, glory, heaviness upon. But those that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Lightly esteemed means a departure of the glory, a leaving of the glory. And we all know from the Bible that when, when the Philistines came and attacked the children of Israel, uh, Phineas and Hophni, the sons of uh, of um, the, the priest decided we are going to carry, well, uh, the, it was Saul who decided, let's carry the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the glory of God, the weightiness of God, the power, the presence of God. Let's take the Ark of God into battle. So when the Ark of God came into the place, Bible says the men shouted so, so, so loud that the earth rang, the earth vibrated because of their cry, because they saw the Ark of the Covenant. Then the Philistines said, what is it that's making the Israelites shout so much? And um, Phineas and Eli had arrived with the Ark, and they said, no, it's the Ark of the Lord that is coming to the midst. And they said, there's never been such where we are fighting against not just men now, we're fighting against the glory of God. The presence of God has come into the camp. So quit ye like men, you Philistines, and be strong and fight. So they fought with tenacity. And because the children of Israel were under a leader whose name Eli, who was the priest, the father of Phineas and Hophni, they had lost the glory. He says, those that, uh, that lightly esteem, those that despise me will be lightly esteemed. So we understand that 
the environment in Israel was that of dishonor. So the nation was broke in the currency of honor. They did not have honor. They could not honor God. Why? Because they were broke. They did not have any currency. What happened? The Bible says Eli was a backslidden priest. He had lost his vision, his ability to see the things of God, to hear the voice of God. The Bible says the word of the Lord was scarce in those days and there was no open vision. So we're already seeing a very dire situation. The priest is blind. The nation is in a backslidden state of apostasy. There's no worship. There's no reverence of God. There is no open vision. And where the people, where there is no vision, the people perish. The word of God was rare in those days. We already see four negative states. So the glory, the nation was being lightly esteemed. They were losing their weightiness. And to compound the situation further, the Bible says Phineas and Hophni had backslidden in their hearts. They were sleeping with women, uh, uh, prostitutes. They were sleeping with women as women came to worship. They were stealing the offering. There we go. We go back now to the, to the Cain saga. Cain robbed God. Phineas and Hophni robbed God. So there was no glory. So when they get into battle, the Philistines decide, let's really be strong and let's fight. And they pull up their socks and really fight hard. And guess what happens? Phineas and Hophni get killed and the Ark of the Covenant is captured. The glory of God is captured and it goes into the land of the Philistines. The Philistines begin to have encounters with the glory of God. They begin to have encounters. I mean, the power of God began to affect them. They became sick. They became sterile. Their, their sexuality was, was affected, and they could no longer have children. They had emeralds, sores, wounds that were growing in their private parts. Judgment had come because there was a breach of protocol. And then they took the, the, the ark and put it in the temple of their God. Dagon, Dagon falls on the ground in the morning. They pick him up. In the next morning, Dagon is fallen to the ground. His head is cut off and his hands are fallen off. Prophetically speaking of Satan's ability to mastermind ideas against you and m manipulate situations with his hands so that he can defeat you. So God was prophetically saying, as much as my people have gone astray, my glory is still dealing judgment against the enemies of my people. They have no glory. And it, it, it is interesting that when a messenger came to bring, to relay message back, Eli was sitting on a chair just like I'm sitting on my couch here. And he was having couch time at the entrance of the city. He sees the messenger coming and he quickly, I mean, he hears that the messenger is coming because he had lost his sight. And he says, what is it? What is it? What's happening in the battle? He says, Phineas and Hophni have been killed. And then he says, what about the ark of the, he says, the ark of the Lord has been captured and taken to the Philistines. Eli falls backwards and he was overweight, undisciplined in his eating and in his honor of God. And the Bible says he broke his neck. His daughter-in-law hears the message, Your father, her father-in-law is dead, the ark has been captured, her husband and her brother-in-law have been killed. And the Bible says she immediately went into labor and gives birth to a son whose name was Ichabod. The word we're researching and studying here is the word kabod. So Ichabod is born at this particular time, prophetically speaking of how that the glory had departed from the house of of Israel. The glory of God had departed. So we are in a dire situation. Those that despise me will be lightly esteemed, will begin to lose glory. That's exactly what happened with Adam and Eve when they sinned against God. The pronouncement of curses, the word curse, the original word in Hebrew does not mean to say, I curse you, you're going to die, you're useless, you're a failure in life. That's what we have reduce the word curse to become in our context today but the original if you do a study of the original word for curse it is not necessarily what the person says to you as a curse but it is what you become by virtue of what you have done so when god comes and announces what was happening to Adam and Eve, it was not because God was just angry with them and saying, I'm so upset with you, you you're going to suffer when you give birth to, to children and you're going to uh, eat from the sweat of your brow uh, and the earth is not going to yield to you her strength. 
It was not just out of an, an anger and God just being upset with man. It was him recognizing that because you have violated a fundamental principle of honor, now you are broken the area of honor. And the result of not having honor in your life is you will not be able to give birth to children pain-free. It's going to be a complicated process. And surviving and feeding yourself is also going to be a complicated process. So how do you reverse that? By bringing back the glory, bringing back the currency of honor in your life so that there is liquidity and you're able to transact in the place of exchange. Here's the big question I need to ask you today. Do you have honor? Are you broke in the area of honor? I don't know where you're watching from, but I want to welcome you. Please let me know where you're watching from. And if you have questions or comments, please do go ahead and comment. Like our page, follow us, stay connected. You will always, great, great, you will always get great faith building content. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. And as we continue, here's the big question. How much of this currency called honor do you have? When you come to the place of exchange, do you have money or are you broke? Many believers are broke in the area of honor. That is why they are broke in the area of money. The only way to increase financially and economically is to first of all increase your honor factor. If your honor factor has dwindled and dried up, Sooner or later, you're going to be broke in the area of finances. So if you're struggling financially, you need to check your honor levels. You need to check your honor levels. Where are your honor levels right now? God is looking for honor. When we honor him, when God is honored, we will be honored. When we glorify God, so are we glorified. When we give honor to God, we've already given you the scripture, and we'll continue to build our case here. So now, let's see if we can read a couple more scriptures and continue to help you understand. I've got 10 more minutes, so give me 10 more minutes, and we're going to conclude this thing. I'm just getting excited all by myself here. I want to read a, a, a series of scriptures just to establish what I have already said. The first one is Genesis chapter 31. Let's rush over. Genesis chapter 31 and verse 3. You see, when I'm reading my normal Bible, this one, which you read from, from the right to the left, it just makes it so much easier. All our books should be written that way anyway. That will really simplify life. But anyway, Genesis chapter, chapter 31, verse 3. And Hashem said to Jacob, or Yaakov, return to the land of your fathers and to your native land, and I will go with you. Pardon me, I'm reading the wrong scripture here. Let me, let me get my correct scripture. Pardon me, give me a few seconds. Honor. We are looking at the word honor. Well, no, pardon me, the word glory. We're looking at the word glory in Genesis. That's verse 1 is what I'm looking for. There we go. It says, then he heard the words of, the, of Laban's sons. And Jacob has taken all that belonged to our father. And from that which belonged to our father, he amassed all this wealth. That's interesting. He has amassed all this wealth. Now, this is the first reference that we have of that direct word, the word kabod. It's translated wealth here in the Torah or the Humash, the Bible I'm reading here. In the King James, it is translated, he has taken all the glory. It's translated glory. So the word glory, the word honor, the word wealth, the, the word kabod are all related. Root word is exactly the same. So there was a transfer of wealth or a transfer of honor or a transfer of glory. Now, the church has been speaking a lot, and I teach on this as well, on the transfer, the great wealth transfer that needs to be taking place. But you see, there cannot be a wealth transfer in your life, in your business, in your personal circumstances, and 
until there is an increase in the measure of honor that is operational on the inside of you. So I want to encourage you, begin to look at the honor factor. So because Yaakov honored God, God honored him. He said, if you read earlier on, on his way to, to, to Padan Aram, he, he stops at a place called Bethel, and in Bethel he honors God. He pours the oil in honor of God. He says, God, if you will keep me, clothe me, feed me, sustain me, I'll come back to this place, Bethel, and I will, uh, this place shall be the house of God, and I will give 10%. I will tithe everything that you bring to me to you. So that act of honor activated a supernatural move of the, in the realm of the spirit that activated a release of wealth. So when he gets to Padanaram, he begins to work for Laban, his uncle. And Laban was not a very wealthy man. He was a poor man. And he was poor because he did not have honor. Laban was the son of Nahor. Nahor was... The, the, if you remember the story when Abram sent um, Eliezer to go and get a wife for his son Isaac, and he got a wife from him, and he came with camels that were loaded with glory or wealth. So Eliezer paid a high price to get a wife for Isaac. So when he got the wife, uh, Nahor got wealth. But Laban was present in the meeting when the lobola was being transacted, when the, the, the transactions, the exchange of value for value was being transacted. So they got value, a wife for Isaac, and he released value, uh, the gold, the wealth, the resources, because he made a statement there, and he says, God has blessed my master greatly, and he has made him very, very rich. As you can see, I have come with all these camels that are loaded with wealth. And that's like coming with a couple of truckloads that are loaded with gold, with wealth, with precious stones. And I mean, just the ring that was put on the nose and the bracelets that were put on there were worth millions in U.S. dollar current value today. So he realized if a guy could just give you a 15 million uh, U.S. dollar gift just to say thank you for watering my camels, uh, and then the rest of the bride price was not even quantified in terms of value. So there was an exchange of wealth there. But because the family of Nahor or Laban, who was a crooked man, had no honor, the Bible tells us that when a man has no honor, his money will leave him. Money will grow wings and fly away. We see that in the book of Proverbs. So L Laban was now poor or just getting by with just, just a little bit. But when Jacob arrives, the wealth factor is activated because one who has the currency of honor is now looking after the wealth or the animals and the livestock of Laban. It begins to increase exponentially. And the Bible says in a conversation between Laban and Yaakov, he says to him, um, when I came to you, what you had was little, but it has increased and it has become much. Increase is taken from the word porats. Porats in Hebrew means uh, uh, where we get perez, bal peretzim, bal peretzim, which means to break forth. In other words, his wealth factor increased suddenly. There was an exponential growth factor. The trajectory of his wealth increased suddenly because there was the presence of a man who was loaded with a currency called Honor, glory to God forevermore. How much honor do you have in your life? How much honor do you demonstrate? And I'm not just talking about honoring God. I'm going to touch on that just now so that you fully understand what we're explaining here. And so Laban is, uh, he's, the sons of Laban say, all our father's wealth or glory has been transferred into the hands of Yaakov. That establishes the principle, wealth goes into the hands of the one with honor. Wealth goes into the one who ha whose hands have honor, into the hands of the one who has honor in their hearts. And now the principle, let me just throw this in. That principle will work whether it is honor as in honoring God or honor as in honoring Satan. The people that honor Satan have lots of money. The measure of wealth that flows into your life is concomitant to the measure of honor that you're demonstrating. Let me say that again. There is 
a relationship between the amount of wealth you are managing and accumulating and that is being transferred to you in the same way to the amount of honor you have with God. This principle of honor is powerful. It applies in the spiritual world. It applies in the financial world. How much honor do you have with your bank? How much honor do, do your, well, we don't use checks. I don't know if we still use checks. I haven't seen a check in, in I don't know how many years. It's now electronic transfers. But how much honor is there in your financial transactions? The moment you begin to lose honor, you lose access to the benefits of the banking system or the banking organization that you're working with. So we see here the wealth was transferred. We also see the, a similar principle applying. Genesis chapter 45 verse 13. I hope I wrote it correctly this time. Genesis 45 13. Let's jump over there to Genesis 45, verse 13. Praise God. Are you learning something? Are you getting stirred up? Are you making a quality decision to build some altars in order to honor God? 45, verse 13. I'm there now. Here we go. Let's read verse 12 and uh, 13. It says, Behold, your eyes see, as do the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that it is my mouth that is speaking to you. Therefore, tell my father of all my glory, all my kabod, mm, all my glory in Egypt, and all that you saw. But, it might, but you must hurry and bring my father down here. Now, J uh, Joseph had gone to... Uh, had gone to Egypt as a slave. But somewhere between him arriving as a slave, being bought by Potiphar, he rises through the ranks, goes through Potiphar's house, makes Potiphar wealthy, goes through the prison, makes the prison a blessed place, gets into the palace, makes the palace a blessed place, and causes all of Egypt to become a blessed nation. Now, what was the key that made this happen? Again, simple, honor, the protocol of heaven, the currency of heaven. Ya uh, Joseph, Yosef, honored his father, Yaakov. And that honor factor that existed caused a blessing to be on him that regardless of where he was, God preserved him. And that's why you'd read right through. When you read the story, it says, and he was a slave in Potiphar's house, but God was with him and the Lord blessed him. Then he was in prison, but the Lord was with him and the Lord blessed him. Then he was in the palace and the Lord blessed him. What was that blessing? It was the currency. God says, whoever honors me, I will honor. Whoever bestows glory, kabod, honor on me, I will bestow honor upon them. I will bless them. I will prosper them. So now Joseph has become the wealthiest and most influential Hebrew man in the whole region. In fact, he, next, to, next to Pharaoh, uh, there is nobody as powerful as Yosef. He is the most powerful man. Whatever he says, Pharaoh will endorse. Pharaoh will agree. If he says this man is to die, Pharaoh will say, let it be so. If he says this man is to live, Pharaoh will say, let it be so. That's how powerful he was. And that was simply because of honor. So God sustains a whole economy for Egypt on the premise of the honor factor that existed in Yosef. So honor is powerful. It causes you to become a wealth master. In fact, if you read in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, and if you read in, in, in right through the Bible, it says they bound Joseph with fetters of iron, but God did not permit them to hurt him. God released him from the chains and made him ruler of Pharaoh's house, ruler of Pharaoh's wealth. So he becomes the wealth master in the house of Pharaoh. Glory to God. Honor is going to make you a wealth master. Once you learn to transact in the realm, in the dimension of honor, you will step into a new level of financial increase and economic power. So we see that Genesis chapter 45 and verse 13. Now I've got to start closing here. When, you, when honor is released to God, he responds by giving honor back to the one that extends honor to.
to him. So you honor God, give glory, kabod, weightiness, uh, uh, fullness, copiousness, all those words I gave you earlier on, when you release that to heaven, heaven reciprocates by releasing that to you. Mm, isn't that beautiful? Oh my goodness. Oh, I got I to gotta jump that. I got to jump a couple of scriptures. Let me do my closing. Let me do my closing right here. So honor activates the supernatural. Honor provokes heaven to respond to you. Honor gives you greater authority in the realm of economic and financial freedom. Now, if you don't believe this principle, all you have to do is study what's happening in the corporate world, in the political world, whatever it is. Who is it that rises and becomes when, let's say we have elections, the elections that are coming up, and uh, then after elections, the president is announced as the new president. What, what does he do first? He begins to elect the people that will work with him in the government. And now, who does he choose? He chooses the people that demonstrated the highest level of honor. He doesn't just choose anybody. He chooses the people that have the currency of honor. In, let's move from politics. Let's come to, to the business world. Who gets promoted in any company? The one who demonstrates the highest level of the currency of honor. Who has the greatest authority, the greatest dominion, the greatest ability to rise up in the ranks? Without honor, you will not be promoted. You've got to honor the policies and the principles of the company. You've got to honor the protocol of the people that decide who gets promoted. You've got to have the currency of honor. Those without honor never go anywhere. If you want financial increase in your life, it's not going to come by doing a toy toy on the streets and holding up a placard saying you want a financial increase. You will get 2.1%, 4.2%, 3.8%, but you will never move into wealth by doing toy toy. You only move into greater wealth by demonstrating higher levels of honor in every area of your life. That means you honor time. You get to work on time. You deliver. You honor your clients by giving them the best service. You honor your clients by delivering on time. You honor your boss by re submitting reports on time in, this, in the structure and format that it is expected with levels of excellence. You always over deliver. What is all of that? It's honor. It's the currency of honor that will determine the amount of wealth that flows into you, whether in the political arena, in the business arena, in the spiritual arena, in the financial arena. Here's the question. How much money is coming into your life on a monthly basis? Let me tell you this. Regardless of the amount of money that's coming into your life, here's the simple principle. The amount of money flowing into your life is a mirror of your level of honor. Your level of honor. The Bible tells us, he said, God speaking himself, he says, honor me with your increase and the first fruits of your, your increase. God is expecting you to demonstrate honor. Have you been honoring God? Have you been honoring the house of God? Have you been honoring your pastor? You know, this, uh, we, uh, as men and women of God, we've probably gone over the last year through, uh, the last two years actually, through probably one of the most toughest periods of time. Men and women of God have been blasted by government and authorities telling us all kinds of things. Then men and women of God have been blasted by the flock. They've been blasted by unbelievers saying, you know, these false prophets, false preachers. And yes, I agree. There is men and women that are doing stuff that they shouldn't be doing. There's people that are just rogues. So, you, But the thing is, the amount of dishonor that has arisen against men and women of God in every arena, including the church, where men and women, members of flocks and churches, ought to be demonstrating the currency of honor by honoring the men and the women of God that are preaching the word to them, serving them, ministering to them, then what do they do? They pull them down, speak negatively, attack them with their tongue, and do all kinds of things. Now, if you have been demonstrating dishonor in any arena. Proverbs warns us against dishonor. If you dishonor the king with your mouth, you will be killed. You will be put to prison because the king hates any form of opposition. So he's teaching us simple principles of honor. So as I close right now, 
I want to pray with you. But my prayers won't make a difference if there is no honor in your life. Are you honoring God with your tithes and with your offering? You need to sow into your house of God. Give your tithes into the house of God. Maybe you're broken hearted, disappointed by a man of God who cheated and did all kinds of things. That does not cancel the fact that you still need to honor God. If a tax revenue authority uh, abuses you and overcharges you on tax and does all kinds of things and cooks your books and you get into trouble, does that change the fact that you still need to pay taxes to the revenue authority? It doesn't change the fact. So honor is a kingdom principle that must not be violated. And it must be honored. And so if you're listening to me today and you're saying, I need a change. I need to see increase financially in my life. I need to see economic shift in my life. I need to get out of crisis, get out of debt, get out of the situation that I am in. You need today to make a quality decision. I'm repenting in every area where I've dishonored the government. I've dishonored men and, uh, men and women in authority. I've dishonored my spiritual authority. And I've uncovered my head and spoken evil of my pastors, my leaders in church. I've spoken evil of members of the body of Christ and mistreated brothers and sisters. The Bible says honor is a currency. Honor one another. So right now, as you take time to pray and repent, I want to pray with you. Father, in the name of Jesus, where we have dishonored you, where we have lost the currency of honor, as your sons and your daughters, and we've dishonored the governments and the authorities over our lives and spoken evil and wickedness against them. Father, forgive us. We repent today. Where we've spoken evil against our pastors. I sense in the body of Christ there's a lot of repenting that needs to be done. You've blasted and spoken evil, wicked words against those in authority. And you, 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 you've run up against a wall and you've got a vagabond spirit roaming all over the place but accumulating nothing. It is because of dishonor. So right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, your grace, your mercy extended upon us as we repent. Father, we ask you for forgiveness. We ask you for restoration. We ask you for healing. And as we repent, Father, thank you for taking us and bringing us to that place of wealth, increase, and influence. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. You are an economic master. You are called by God to walk and live and demonstrate kingdom wealth. Let's get back into the protocol of heaven. Join me again tomorrow as we explore this further. I want to give you a couple of examples, and we're going to go and extend this all the way to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament and help you understand how to make it work for you. You are born to be a wealth master. Thank you so much for joining me today. Buy these books that are displayed here. Invest in yourself. Go to birthingamegaeconomy.africa. Get the resources. Begin to read. Begin to study. And begin to apply the principles. And you will become the wealth master God has called you to be. God bless you.